Uh, hello, guys. Now we will try to discuss uh, different topics, hot topics, I guess. So first of them is uh, self-publishing. Uh, what do you think about self-publishing nowadays? In current situation, uh, we have trend of, uh, I don't know, uh, that uh, classical publishers are gone away and there are a lot of possibilities for self-publishing, but new problem arising for developers who try to do it themselves. What do you think about it? Okay, we can start from, from the one side to another. From the beginning. Yeah, Sergey, please tell us something about it. I think as the relationship evolves between the developers and publishers, developers tend to assume more and more responsibility for whatever happens to their game. And even if you're still working with someone who collects the money, you most likely are much more involved in issues like customer support and uh, whatever exposure you have to the legal risks and the uh, financial risks. And you can no longer step back and hope that the publisher sells it, but you have to be proactive in uh, working to promote your game from, from day one, from whenever you begin the development and not uh, wait until when the game is ready and you can actually ship. And I think this calls for developers to become much stronger in business development and to maybe an open a position. And you know, 10 years ago, probably everybody wanted to hire a good producer. And right now, everybody wants to hire a good business development guy. And, and that, that's my point. OK. Uh, OK, um, I can tell my opinion from uh, Indy. Uh, I think um, self-publishing depends uh, about your team. For example, if you have a person who can do great marketing, he can spend all his time, full time, to do marketing, that's OK. You can uh, do self-publishing for Steam, for example. Uh, but. If, uh, but I would like to go with publisher, but not ordinary publisher, uh, uh, some kind of indie publisher like uh, uh, Tiny Build, uh, maybe Double Fine, uh, something like that. Uh, and uh, these publishers uh, pay big attention for every game that's not like Conveyor. So uh, this publisher understands indie uh, great, and uh, I would like to go with some publisher like this. So, so the new trend is uh, that uh, indie, indie publishers yes. appear. Yes. That uh, publishers who are doing exactly the indie games on some Steam yes. markets, on mobile yes, markets. Yes. And so it's uh, yeah. good. Uh, I, I, I have not remembered the name. The guys who released Hotline Miami 2. Digital Devolver. Yes, yes, these guys. Or well, these guys the best. <laughs> well, the, uh, what I would like to publish with guys like this. So, so this trend uh, means that there is still some place for publishers, even for indies, right? Andrei, yes. what do you think about it? One, one, okay. I wasn't sure if it's working. Uh, yeah, I would, uh, I can say from a mobile perspective, uh, yeah. because Asteroid started in 2008 as a, a mobile game studio for iOS back then and then Android. Um, so. About self-publishing, I would say that uh, it's not the, like the hottest news for anyone, but uh, uh, when mobile started, it was such a lucrative market for uh, uh, self-publishing development. Uh, for developers like us, for example, it was so easy to get your game to the top and get lots of downloads uh, just because the game was cool. And uh, nowadays, it's, uh, like I said, it's not news, but uh, uh, the whole top charts are, uh, are busy with games from big publishers like major ones, and getting uh, your game noticed is so, so hard. So uh, here I would agree with Sergey uh, that nowadays being a small developer doesn't mean that uh, you can just develop a game and that's it. You have to think about marketing, about uh, business development. You gotta find your partnerships really well and uh, find the smartest way to get your game promoted and noticed. So that's like... That's so you are doing all that stuff Inside, inside your studio, right? Well, yeah, we're trying to. I think that's, uh, well, like I said, even the smaller developers have to think in this way, like sort of a small publisher to get your game noticed. Yeah, we're definitely trying to uh, find our ways about that. Just, just to figure out, how many people do you have in your studio? Uh, 15. Okay. So, yeah. So, let's think about this. 
we're in the best of times and worst of times of being an indie developer. I mean, we're in a situation where we can get our content on any platform extremely easily. And obviously, being part of Unity, it's great being one of those kind of forces that make make that possible. But the thing is that the skills of a publisher are very different from the skills of a developer. We have to understand an audience. We have to understand how to use the communication channels. We have to understand how we're going to require users. And we're doing that in a context where there are over a million apps, obviously, on each of the app stores. You know, there's more supply than we could possibly play in our lifetime. If you think about that, there are more games out there, and you're still making games? More games you could possibly play in your lifetime? That's the challenge we're up against. And we have to realize that at the same time, the old, I'm old, I'm allowed to say this, you know, you know I'm old. Um, there used to be a nice, easy way. We went to a publisher, the publisher had retail stores. They put our games into plastic boxes and put them on shelves. That was easy. And then digital distribution smashed that to pieces. And now, how we find an audience is so, you know, lined up with sociability, so lined up with, you know, which application, which device, which combination of experiences you want to create. If you look at some of the charts, EDAR guys talked about the way people acquire. Obviously, featured is useful. But so is when your friend shows you the game they've just played. All this kind of stuff, all incorporating all this information into game design is where the real trick lies. So we have to find either partners who are able to bring us this kind of route to market, and most of the old school publishers don't know it yet, and they're still learning. Or we have to learn those skills ourselves and incorporate that with all the other things, all the other risks we've got to control. So if you have the skill to understand the audience, if you have the skill to know how to communicate to them and how to get distribution on all the channels, then yes, of course, self-publishing is absolutely possible. But it takes deep pockets and a lot of skill. And sometimes the publisher might be a better choice. Yeah, <laughs> if, you, if you check that picture, it shows how, how hard it's sometimes to, to do everything yourself. Okay. Yeah, self-publishing is a, such a great idea that we at Create Mobile totally support it. Four years ago, we started as developer. Right now, we have more than 200 million downloads, uh, and we usually treat them as users because they easily switch between our products. Uh, we have 200 million uh, uh, people playing our games and we become a publisher so self-publishing is a great way but uh, it it may be the, the, the fact that market is changing and it's not so easy to self-publish nowadays it's also uh, depends on the what kind of game you have if you have a game that you know imitates many other titles uh, but have some you know tiny uh, very very small differences you better go uh, and try to persuade some publisher to, to, to push it to the market. If you have a great title, but you don't have much resources on your team to do it by yourself, you better go to the publisher and uh, let him do this job for you. If you have a pretty unique title and you don't know how to sell it, you, and nobody else know, uh, know how to sell it, it you, you still have a chance uh, to go to platforms, to talk to Apple, talk to Google Play, maybe go to some uh, very strange niches and uh, try to try to publish by itself. It's, it still may, may lead you to great success. But uh, it's definitely that working with publisher nowadays uh, is is easy way to, to get to the top, to the top 10, mostly. <laughs> OK. Well, it depends on the, on the title, of course, and uh, on the power that your publisher uh, have. OK, thank you. Guys, do you have something to add? OK, let's move on. Uh, the next uh, thing we w I want to discuss with you is Kickstarter. It's not hottest trend already, <laughs> you all know about it, but uh, we have some new changes on the market with Kickstarter with, uh, that I want to discuss with you. So what do you think about Kickstarter for game projects right now, for indie game projects right now? It's a very new idea. Yeah. Uh, you get a lot of attention. Yeah. Uh, the media will write about you. Uh, first when you start Kickstarter, then when you get like first $10,000. Uh, yeah, I, I think Kickstarter uh, right now is a pretty challenging uh, undertaking and it takes a lot of effort for the team to put together all the assets that you need. Uh, you'll run the Kickstarter for months, so that's a month of your life uh, taken away and they'll probably you'll spend three months preparing for it. 
you then have to uh, deal with all the rewards and all the backers. And what we are seeing is that the developers who are uh, more experienced in self-publishing, they can still use Kickstarter. And the developers who cannot, they're getting ten, twenty thousand dollars and that's pretty much it. And, and I think this split is pretty good because it basically pushes the developers to be more aware of the need to communicate. And unless you can communicate, even Kickstarter will not help you once the novelty factor is out of the way. Uh, okay. Um, what I can say about Kickstarter, I don't have any experience in it, but have some thoughts about um, I think Kickstarter good for pay attention for a game uh, from press. Uh, as well, it's uh, really, really good if you are a famous developer, if you have a game really famous, that's good. And I think for indie developers, Kickstarter, it's a good milestone. Uh, for example, you're developing, developing, developing game and uh, you, don't, you don't know the time uh, when stop and release your game. But Kickstarter can mobilize you, you have a great uh, milestone. We want to go to Kickstarter and you prepare a game for this for this time and you have already almost ready game and you can release after getting some money. So that's that's maybe good for in, uh, small indies who uh, who don't have enough experience uh, in uh, finishing the game. Kickstarter okay. it's uh, uh, some kind of previous finish your game. Okay. Yeah. But do you think it, it worth the efforts that it takes to... to uh, just, I think, uh, indies the, uh, <coughs> don't, uh, don't want to, uh, to, to spend three months to prepare to kickstart. Maybe, uh, maybe for, I, I mean for marketing, not game. Um, I think they s should spend one week, and okay. they, that's worth of it. So it's a good thing to finish the game. Okay. <coughs> Andre? Yeah. Uh, Unlike the guys here uh, who are making uh, premium, you're, you're also premium games, and Sergey is uh, working on a premium game as well. Well, so uh, unlike uh, the guys, where our uh, games uh, always uh, have been online games, and so uh, because of that, we have chosen a free-to-play model to work with. It was so good for us, and we know how to make great games that are free to play for the players. And uh, uh, the Kickstarter was, wasn't historically good for free to play games. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's a great platform if you have an indie title, check. It's absolutely, they love your indie titles. Is it a premium game? Yes, it will go well with Kickstarter. If it's free to play, online game, even though I think everybody here would agree that on, uh, for online games, Free to play is one of the best things that happened to this to this uh, kind of uh, products. So even though Kickstarter wasn't good for free to play, so uh, for me the great question is uh, whether there is a good way of uh, making a successful Kickstarter campaign for a free to play game, and whether this is going to be changed in the, in the next couple of years. Because the uh, I'm, I I see that uh, the understanding of uh, of a free to play model. Uh, Increases in players like more and more people understand why this why this model is good. So at some point, I think that's going to be like uh, at this point still a lot of hate uh, at Kickstarter exists for free to play, and I wonder if this is going to change. So that's like it's not a trend, more the, like a question for me. Yeah. So okay. Thank you. And what about the fact that Kickstarter is just dying? It's uh, getting well, smaller and smaller. Yeah, that's exactly where I was going to go. So, um, you know, we have to remember that, you know, for every Double Fine Adventure, there's uh, the Yogscast game or the um, Clang. Anyone, anyone familiar with Clang? I, I back Clang. It was uh, an, uh, an idea to build a sword-style controller, which I absolutely love the idea of, and they recently said that they're going to have to cancel the project because it wasn't enough fun. There's a lot of failures recently, and I think that there's a bit of a depression going on in terms of, of Kickstarter. And I absolutely agree on the, on the free-to-play side of things as well. It's been a particular problem. I think there's a much more fundamental kind of question here, which is, uh, what is Kickstarter good for? And I think, you know, it's great if you have an established brand, if you have an established community, if you have an established, uh, easily communicated beast, and you're basically selling pre-orders. You're not selling investment, 
you know, you're not, you're not getting people to get shares, you're getting to buy pre-orders, essentially. And to sell pre-orders, which is essentially what we're doing here, you have to sell it in the way that the audience wants to buy it. And at the moment, if you have an indie game that's got a quirky, exciting piece or a board game, you can still capture your imagination of that audience and they will pre-order. Uh, a friend of mine just recently um, launched the Paranoia role-playing upgrade, role-playing game, um, and he was asking for, I think it was $30,000 and has got 125,000, 25 days left to go. Because there's a brand that if you're a role-playing geek like me, you will absolutely love. And because you love it, you don't care if it's ever actually made. You want to show that I'm going to back this because I think it's important. There's a contradiction, isn't there? We're selling pre-orders, but actually the audience are buying ambition. They're buying hope. They're not actually necessarily spending money in the same way they would on physical goods. So we're basically got this kind of dilemma as, as people who are accessing these um, kind of crowdsourcing things. We have a difference between what we're trying to build and what our audience is trying to buy. So we have to think really carefully about what that means and essentially work out where it fits into our scene. I think a lot of the stuff we've said so far is really valid. You know, have we got a free-to-play game? Well, how can we be so disruptive about the free-to-play game that people desire to show their love for the idea enough to give us their cash on a Kickstarter or a Cedars or a uh, Crowdcube or any of these other um, kind of crowdsourcing services? And if we can solve that, if we can actually address that, and we can see that we've got the ability to deliver, and we can see that we've got the ability to make this more worthwhile than simply putting that effort and, and marketing into promoting the game itself, then yeah, the Kickstarters absolutely have to be there. But the big ticket ones are always where there's an established name, an established community, and a really cool idea that people want to see made. If you can answer those three things, I think it's worth doing. OK, thank you. Uh, again, uh, I will agree with Andrew. Uh, the Kickstarter is not the best place for the free-to-play titles so far uh, as our company focuses on, on free-to-play games. We don't, we don't consider Kickstarter as the option for any of our developers. But personally, I really love the idea. I really love the idea of, crazy, uh, of spending money on some crazy things or some bizarre thing, something that you know, reminds me about the future not about the uh, uh, present. And in these uh, terms, I would, I would better spend money on some you know, real life products and to s on some crazy, I don't know, uh, watches or whatever it is, some bands or some gaming equipment. Uh, but in games in this perspective is maybe an opportunity to spend less than I can uh, afford uh, for, for some, some real uh, world product. It's not $99, it's not 160 I, I can spend like $5 or $8 just to, just to support the crazy idea. But you should realize that you gotta be making some really weird, some really bizarre game if you go into Kickstarter. Or maybe you have a, you have a great community and brand and you just you know, want to make some pre-orders. Pre That's a good way to do it. Okay, thank you. While we have started to speak about future, let's talk about a topic like multi-platform and not uh, just multi-platform, but maybe different interesting platforms what you think uh, will be worth your interest and the interest of uh, developers in the future. What about this? And one more issue, should you uh, support all the platforms or should you concentrate your efforts on one? I think technically Unity is now enables all of us to go multi-platform from day one. Yes, but what about preparing game but, launch and so on? Yeah, but, but, but if, you, if you launch the game, it's not only about the technical readiness of the product, it's also about building the community and working with that community and working with the platform. And I think you should really go multi-platform if you can do multi-platform in terms of communication and in terms of launching and self-publishing. And if you cannot do it, then it doesn't matter how many platforms you can physically support on day one. You should really go where you can be the strongest in terms of releasing your game. And it's great to have Unity helping us so much and it just pretty much opens the potential for 
going truly multi-platform once you have strong enough marketing and business team that can uh, you know, build up on top of the technical capability of you know, going to Sony and having a meeting with Sony and agreeing with them on something and then going to different other platform holders and agreeing with them something. If you can do it at the same week, then great. If not, then not. Okay. Um, I agree with Sergey. Just uh, want to add something about, uh, if you talk about indie, I think uh, thinking about multi-platform, it's really good because uh, for indie, um, you, uh, you should not uh, put all eggs in one basket because um, it's really risky. And one another thing I want to talk, uh, if we are talking about hottest game industry trends and about multi-platforms, I would like to say about virtual re reality because uh, I believe it's uh, the future for game industry because uh, it brings um, new feelings for players. Because uh, everything we have now, that's really good, but it's a little, it, that's not brand new. But um, virtual reality it is, uh, and I can tell about uh, example for one game. For, uh, this game is, uh, I saw a let's play of this game. I have not played it by myself, but let's play. Uh, uh, show me everything. Uh, this game is uh, Don't Let Go. Uh, in this game, you, uh, you have virtual reality glasses, and uh, you just should uh, present hold two control buttons like this. Uh, you are sitting in, um, in the office, uh, you can see laptop and you should press uh, two control buttons uh, and uh, don't release it. And uh, uh, for, uh, from start you can see a lot of flies flying around you and uh, you won't do it like this, but you can't, you, you should hold it, that's okay. After that uh, you can see a spider going by your head and after that you, 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 can, you can see but you can hear scratching. <laughs> uh, in your head, you you really want to do ah, but uh, after that you can see a lot of other things, dinosaur, uh, sh switching off the light. But um, um, in the final, th this game is really short. I think four minutes. In the final, uh, you can see on the laptop uh, the developer's face, and uh, he's congratulate you. Okay, you're a really great man. You you, uh, you finish my game. But uh, one more thing, and the laptop is closing. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So uh, that's really, really good, good feeling. I, I was so surprised. So I believe it will be a really good trend for the future. Okay, thank you. Talk about spoilers. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So uh, about the platform, I will. Uh, uh, my view of this as a CEO of a company that makes online games. Uh, online games were always about the social factor. So, as a fact, we know that, uh, for example, in our uh, in our uh, one of our biggest games, Clash of the Damned, uh, the players who are uh, join ha who have joined the clan are uh, staying in the game for much much longer time. They're willing to spend more money. They uh, they have more fun w with the game in general. So. Uh, for us, it means that uh, if I have a game on Android and uh, a person is playing this game and one of the things he wants to is to play with his, his friends or her friends. So it makes a lot of sense to have your game on as many platforms as possible and uh, make sure if you do this that uh, your game is closed platform. So you can play with from iOS, you can play with Facebook and a PC and stuff like that. So. Uh, this is the great challenge uh, in terms of technical stuff and marketing, like uh, Sergey said, and community support. And this is one, actually one of the uh, things why I would uh, emphasize the point of that the developer has to think as a publisher in a way. Because, for example, uh, I believe the best way to support your game is by developer. So, if you have, a, especially if you have an online game. Only the developer will know all the things about this game to support your community in the best way. You cannot just outsource this to your publisher. They will do kind of a shitty job, probably. So uh, do it yourself. And uh, yeah, getting back to the uh, multi-platform, if you do an online game, you got to make sure it's uh, on most platforms as possible just because of the social factor. Because your players want to play with their friends. So whatever platform they're playing, just make sure your game's there and you will be fine. Okay, thank you. So, I mean, 
obviously, you know, it's great to hear lots of people say the same thing, but, you know, obviously with Unity now, the technical side of the challenge is basically solved uh, in most cases. But um, there's actually some more fundamental questions. I think some of them are hinted at. I think it comes down to two things, mode of use and cross-platform synergy. And these two things are in tension. Mode of use is that thing that makes us choose all those different screens. So when I've got my watch, my, my Galaxy Gear is broken, that's why I'm not wearing it. Uh, when, I, when I use my watch, it's about the second. When I use my um, seven-inch tablet, it's about the sort of five minute. When I watch, use my phone, I, use, I have a, a, a Note, uh, Note 3, it's a nice big phone. I, I'm gonna only get it out if my watch tells me it's important enough to get my, my phone out. But I don't necessarily play all my games on that phone because I don't wanna run out of battery on that thing. Therefore, I choose my tablet. And therefore, I, I then pull out my laptop. I, got myself a Surface Pro 3 recently, so I'm now playing Steam games on effectively a All these devices, even down to the TV in our living room, their mode of use is the important thing. What that means is, it's not just the time I'm gonna take playing on that thing. It's the circumstances, it's the social connectivity that they represent. Each of these different screens have a unique profile, and our game design has to suit that profile. Not just that it's a great game, but that it works in the context of the devices that's being used. And that takes effort. You know, that's, there's a reason why teams, you know, like the, the guys at King who, who do Candy Crush have separate teams looking after each of the builds of Candy Crush. We think Candy Crush is the same game on all those platforms, and it isn't. It's actually slightly, you know, tweaked and poked and changed in order to feel the same on all of those devices. And that's a non-trivial exercise. That's about pure game design. Being so fastidious as designers, that we care about the perfect alignment between device and player. And that is not trivial. But the tension is that there is also cross-platform synergy. That synergy means that the more platforms, the more devices we have, the more sales, the more revenue we'll get because of the binding nature of all of the people we can now address because of all the devices we can connect to. So we really want to have these experiences, but we have to put the effort in and we have to make sure, as we rightly said earlier, that we've chosen the right devices for the launch of the experience. But of course, I'm talking generically. When we start talking about those games, you talk about the, the you know holding the button down. Um, I mean, there's so many you know virtual VR games out there that are coming. I mean, my favourite one uh, is a, t a test demo that they've got on Oculus, which is a an elephant's trunk. Have you seen that one? It's just brilliant. It's just brilliant. It looks a little bit like kind of a colourful me and my Katamari kind of game, but I've got an elephant's trunk and I'm literally swishing my head around, and the trunk follows around and smashes everything around. It's brilliant. I'm not playing that on my mobile. I'm sorry, but I'm not. It's just not going to work on a mobile. It has to be the VR goggles. And there are other things, like there will be watch games. You know, the, the idea of the second being important. I mean, if you think about, if you don't think you're, if you're not looking at watch game development now, you will be. There'll be more studios doing that, than I think, than mobile phone games soon. But, oh, okay, maybe not. I'm exaggerating slightly. But if you think about what that means, the immediacy, that means mobile allowed us to drop in and drop out every five, ten minutes playing a game. We wouldn't have done that on a PC. We wouldn't have done that on a console. On a console, I'm going to sit down in my living room in nice comfort with surround sound, massive, great, big television for six hours minimum, because basically it takes that long to start the bloody thing up. Um, sorry, I used to work at Sony. I'm allowed to say nasty things about console development. But that sort of is a different experience. I will put up with stuff on a console I would never forgive on a mobile. It, uh, what's the game? I think it was Last of Us. I think it was that. I'm not sure. Oh, no, it's Watch Dogs. Watch Dogs. Not a bad game. Great game. First five minutes, I press X ten times. <laughs> I can't do anything else for the first five minutes. No way is that acceptable. Except on a console. Actually, it's not acceptable on a console as well. But that's another subject. So, but, but do you get my drift? We're talking about understanding the audience first. Actually, that's it. That's the point. What do the audience get out of our game? Choose the right devices to satisfy that. Use the technology we've got to make it possible to share those experiences, whether it's watching it or playing it, and do that well, and then you'll have success. Thank you. Yep, sounds great. I mean, uh, but let's get back to the ba uh, basics. If you're making a game that you want to 
publish with uh, with a publisher that uh, you you want to you want to grab uh, get the audience to play this, you have to consider this uh, mandatory factors like uh, virality. That's that's issue. If if you don't have a uh, Canvas application on Facebook, you will get limited access to the uh, Facebook graph. So you you have to create Facebook application besides application Android and iOS before launching it. And if you want to, uh, you, if, if you want to save on user acquisition, if you want to attract as more players as you want. So this is multi-platform strategy. Go to, if you go into iOS, if you go into Android, if you go into for, for the global release, just think about creating three different uh, games. It's, it doesn't matter if it's going to be a Unity based or you know you, you developing it with the three different teams. You just have to uh, have the same maybe backup or the same connectivity between devices. Uh, but at the same time, you should you you, you got to be realizing or very important thing that the multi platform gives you the access to the new niches like uh, home entertainment. Right now, we can we, we see that Android devices supporting uh, TV screens as uh, as your you know uh, play. It's a, it's a place where you can actually spend some time playing games. You you going back for the uh, in terms of the uh, game controls, you starting to use some joysticks again. That's you know just some sort of the opportunity. It's, it's rather the the new opportunity for mobile game developers to go uh, to the niche that was occupied by console uh, game developers because the quality of mobile games is uh, increasing. Seriously, in, in last years, with this metal technology and uh, what uh, with 4K devices, uh, it's 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 going crazy, guys. And uh, but again, just if if you're able to treat many platforms simultaneously, that's okay. This is the best strategy. If you uh, have resources just for the one device, it's better focus on this and go directly to the platform. Uh, and talk to them about exclusivity and maybe some, you know, marketing in exchange for this. That's one of the opportunities. Uh, as for our experience, we start for, with uh, Google Play always, because we do many soft launches. We 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 trying to make game better before the global release. That's 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 the only uh, it's the only issue when that. That you might have. This, you might want to test on the real audience, but when you go, when you're thinking about global release, think about you know, really global. Uh, I just want to add up one other thing. Um, there is all, there, we're talking about trends here, so we ought to at least recognize the other trend, which is about the cloud. So you know, the thing is that I think most people misunderstand what the cloud's about. You know, and they get, oh, it's cloud, yeah, it's gonna be great. No, it's just servers and, and, and processor in, in, the, in the network. That's all we need to worry about. Um, but what it means, what we can unlock when we recognize what the cloud can do, what, what online services and memory and all that kind of stuff can deliver to us, you know, we, can, we can render things on the cloud and deliver experiences which are richer and deeper than even the next generation console, even on a mobile, but only if we have connectivity. So we have to recognize that there is these fantastic resources. And actually, all of these devices we've got have one thing in common, that they're connected most of the time. They're not always connected. So we need to have the ability to recognize what power and ability and delivery capability the device we have has, plus what we can then do to extend that using connectivity. Because there's two things that we get out of that. The ability to create games we couldn't possibly have imagined before, but also the ability to connect people through all of these experiences. And if we're going to think about multi-platform, Let's not just think about what the game could do on the device. Let's think what the cloud delivers and how that creates an experience that's connected. And I think that's going to be much more profound. OK, thank you. Uh, well, we have uh, three more topics, but we don't have enough time. So let's talk about the most interesting of them, the most trendy, maybe. We will skip uh, Steam, <laughs> Early Access, and Greenlight. <laughs> Sorry for that, guys. And we'll talk about IP developing. What do you think about this? What do you think about creating some toys and maybe some uh, books, comics, and movies, and that's it? What about IP developing? Uh, 
let, let's let's yep change. You mean uh, Rovio IP or in no. general? No, <laughs> <laughs> it's a good option, but maybe you'll talk about your road IP developing. I, I think that the road is very difficult to the point where you can actually sell merchandise on, on even a local scale, not to mention the global scale. And there are a few developers who have made that uh, path, and there's probably many more who will, but uh, it takes years, and it takes definitely a, a pretty strong team to deliver that. Uh, so I would probably say that the, in terms of IP, the question right now is controlling your IP, first of all, owning it, and once you are successful in this, you can think about exploiting it across different mediums. But the first step should be that you should be the owner if you create this IP, and unless you are the owner, you can forget about the whole thing. And, and once you own, then you have to manage it, you have to nurture it, you have to grow it, and so on. So uh, I think he owns his IP. I mean, a few people here own their IPs. And, and for you, yes, the focus is how do I grow this? But for people who are currently in the relationship where they don't have the control, the first question is, how do I get to the point where I control it? OK. Um, I think you should, at first, you should have really, really, really strong brand. And um, only a few brands now can do it. For example, Rovio, Cut the Rope, Minecraft. Uh, I think you should not think about it now when you started making your game. Um, I'm sure when your game uh, will be so popular like Minecraft, uh, people who are doing some IP developing like toys will go to you and ask you, please, uh, please allow us to make toys. So. This is useless now? Yeah, just give it a minute. Okay. okay, so ju just about a month ago, I think, uh, at the Southern Conference in Vilnius, Life Mobile, uh, we discussed, uh, there was a panel where we discussed the uh, uh, 3D toys, uh, 3D printed toys for, yeah. for, uh, for games. So obviously, uh, if you want to make uh, toys and uh, the actual merchandise, you need to be uh, at least Rovio, but uh, what I think about great about this, about 3D printing technology, is that it will probably at some point bring this long tail effect to the game development community. Uh, what I mean by that is that I would love to see, and I think this, this will emerge in maybe in a year or so, uh, a, an SDK that would allow me to uh, uh, embed uh, some sort of a 3D toy magazine, uh, that magazine shop, into my game. Like, for now, I, I'm over embedding like offer walls and advertisement SDKs. This way, I would like to uh, embed some sort of a 3D printing shop where my players would be able to uh, order their customized toys and be delivered to their door. I think this uh, is where like I think we're only maybe a year away from this, this stuff. And uh, one of the points, great things for developers, is this is the additional way of monetizing your game. Because uh, for, for us, for example, in free-to-play online games, uh, there is a lot of players that are so much dedicated to the game. They're, they're spent like eight hours playing the game, uh, uh, like every day. We have such players. So these people would love to, to pay, pay some money to get their toys, uh, especially if they can be customized, which can be easily done with 3D printing technology. So I think this is the next step, uh, because obviously not everybody has, uh, has this sort of a brand uh, as, as Angry Birds or uh, Candy Crush, but uh, there's a lot of games that have dedicated players. So this is the way, I think. And I really believe this will happen soon. OK, but can I just ask you why this didn't happen with regular printing? Like nobody is buying posters, nobody is buying T-shirts, because you can already have multiple shops that can sell me a T-shirt, but I don't know many many studios who would make any money through merchandise, which is already available. So, 3D printing a character, how is this different from printing a T-shirt with, with with the character from your game? Why would someone pay for a 3D print? Um, well, uh, I think one of the uh, it might be true that it will not emerge. But uh, 3D printing will bring uh, so much change that I think many people will just love the stuff that... Well, 
the main point I would say that uh, T-shirts are so different from 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 uh, gaming merchandise. If you go to, uh, I think the first, uh, if you like some game, the first stuff you wanna buy buy is some figurine, not not the T-shirt, right? If you go to Forbidden Planet in London, will you buy a T-shirt or just a figurine of Assassin's Creed? Okay, guys, so what about some other stuff, like board games? Well, well, yeah. let, well let's step back. Before we go into that, let's step back, because I think we actually have to work out what a brand is. Because yeah. a brand, you know, we assume, is something that's already established. And, you know, the, the whole point about the Robbio thing is, that, for me anyway, is that what they found is that they had this recognizable experience, and they built on that, and they allowed that to become something that flourished into something that was recognizable internationally, that was referenced in TV shows. It became part of a social zeitgeist. And that's a momentum. That's a momentum that's actually really important because I will have a Rovio t-shirt because I'm associating my identity, my social identity, publicly with a brand. That's a big deal. That's, psych that's a psychological kind of shift in gear. That's different from having a t-shirt that talks about um, you know, a particular character. It's a something that is saying who I am. Uh, so there's some deep-seated stuff that happens when you start dealing with brands. You know, and, and, until Robbio, um, I, th I think there were like really only probably three globally recognized game characters. You know, uh, Lara Croft, Sonic the Hedgehog, and Mario. I mean, it, you could argue there are others, but I mean, those three were off, often quoted. In, and about the money that some of these big studios put in in the old days to try and build brands around their game characters. Spyro the Dragon didn't really work, but they spent huge amounts of money. Brands aren't just about the money you throw. They're not just about the communication messages. They're about what they symbolically represent. And you have to be able to help your audience care enough to make that work. The way I try and get people to understand the psychology of this is to think about a particular phrase I'm going to say. Uh, and sometimes non-English speak, non-first language English speakers don't hear me correctly. So I'm gonna be very careful in saying this. Han shot first. Anybody know what I mean when I say Han shot first? Han Solo shot first in the cantina. Anyone care about that? Anyone in the room? Proper Star Wars fan? Okay, so there's a couple of us. Okay, <laughs> it really matters, doesn't it? It really matters that Han Solo shot first in the cantina. To us, but to nobody else. <laughs> That's what social identity theory is about. I identify as a real true, full-blooded Star Wars fan, because I know if Han Solo doesn't shoot Grebo in the cantina at the beginning of the film, there is no point in him coming back at the end of the film to save the galaxy, because his character hasn't evolved, hasn't changed, and no one who doesn't watch the first version of Star Wars cares, because it's not important. But it is important to us, and that's what brands are about. It's creating things where we can identify ourselves as belonging to, and everybody else as not. And okay, is a, is a red bird toy really that kind of profound thing? Probably not. But the message, the sort of underlying psychology of what makes that happen is the same thing. Have you got something in your game that makes it possible for an audience to hook onto it and say, I identify as being part of that community? Because if you don't, you haven't got a brand. So the reason why I think GTA and Call of Duty and all this kind of stuff work is not just because of the billions of dollars, and it's taken billions of dollars to build up those brands, but it's because of the promise they represent. I am a shooter player. I am a guy who plays these kind of video games. And you're not if you don't get these jokes, if you don't get these inner things. And so being part of the social zeitgeist that says, I can have the conversation about what happens when you drive around the corner with the hooker, you know, that kind of thing, which some of you know what I'm talking about. That is what makes the brand powerful. Not making t-shirts, not making things. Oh, um, um, that <laughs> says it all. Thank you. Thank Thank you. you. Oscar, I didn't get an idea, but still. <laughs> okay. uh, I do have a McDonald's t-shirt. I don't know. I don't know why. I, seriously, I, I bought it at Uniqlo for five dollars. But are That's, you loving it? Uh, I'm not. But I'm wearing it sometimes when nobody cares, and nobody sees me. You know, uh, <laughs> it's just you know the, my way of you know reconnecting with the brand, right? I, uh, like instead of going there and eating some shitty food. Uh, 
It's, it's some sort of nostalgic feeling. Uh, but guys, uh, before you actually start printing some t-shirts and uh, fi figurines, again, you have to create this brand. That's, that was that, that discussion about. This is pretty hard to do. This, this as, as we discussed, is going to be a long way of uh, creating a community that actually admires you, that uh, creating a brand that, that just, you know, make people do crazy things again. Like ordering sixty dollar figurines uh, for with with game characters, I can imagine that some people doing this in a, you know like a real world reward. Uh, it's it's the same thing that the, the some pers some part of the players actually admires a lot of uh, these awards that can share on the social profiles, but not so many people are actually doing this. So we should we should remember that. And there's also some startup companies already. My friend in France is, uh, is doing uh, something that Andrew described. You can get the SDK Fabs app, actually. The, uh, the, you, can, you can embed this uh, SDK2 game, have a small store, upload the 3D models, and bang, just you know, let player to, to order it and uh, get it by, by, regular, by, by snail mail. And uh, it, uh, it just costs a lot. It brings developer small portion of the uh, actual money that your player spends. That in terms of the free-to-play mechanics, dude, I would I would let him spend thousand dollar in my game. I don't want him to spend thousand dollar on some figurines that I will be receiving like only fifty dollars. It's the same thing as uh, you know cash tournaments in the game. Some people ready to, to spend money on it, but you should remember that developer will not make any money of it. There is another perspective in this idea. If we're not creating brand, we, we may be easier to go to the place where all the brands are, like Hollywood, take something, monetize it uh, in different way as the way as we used to it, and uh, grab the attention of the audience and make more money. That's, this way will be more easy. I mean, if you bring me a ready farm game, I will rebrand it with some Hollywood titles and push it to the market. Seriously, talk to me. Uh, in a bronze sponsored area after that, I will, I will, will make a deal. But uh, again, we, we, if, we, if we see this, it's some titles like Kim Kardashian and uh, you know, I don't know, Smurfs, it it's, wasn't created by, by, by gamers, it was created by, by, by media. That's, that's uh, you're absolutely right. I just want to, there's a caveat though, isn't there? That, uh, THQ went that way and their woe happened, you know, bad, bad things happened. But because a lot of the IP holders don't have a real understanding of what the value of the brand is for that medium and will often ask for too much and actually ca handicap the ability for the game developer to make money from that license, I would argue. And the other thing I'd, I just want to raise as well is the, 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 the thing about the physicality, you know, the physical good, the 3D printed good you're not going to get a huge amount of money from it. And maybe it's still a bit too early. However, I think there's a different value in having a physical item to a virtual item, which is also valuable. Because then that audience member has identified themselves as being belonging by putting that item inside their house or wearing it as a T-shirt, whatever it might be. And that's a different value, particularly if the physical item can carry some momentum as a social audience. Why does you know, video work in replays? It's because we're showing off to our friends what we're doing and what we love to other people. But you've got to know that. You've got to be building on that, I think, to make that work. OK. Uh, I should ask, do we have some time for questions? Five minutes. OK, we're ready for some questions from the audience, please. So let's go. One question. Come on, guys. <laughs> Any questions? If anybody realize what we've been talking about or just what was the topic of the discussion? So <laughs> here's the question. What, what do you think is the hottest gaming trend right now? It's just, just in a, maybe a couple of words, like virtual reality. That's it. OK. Anything else? Home entertainment. What else? Guys, just give me a quick shot. I'm trying to invest. OK. Please give them a microphone so they can <laughs> say something. Uh, now I can see the trend with short, short, really hardcore game like Flappy Bird, and maybe um, uh, it will be combined in the future with virtual reality. So maybe it will be the trend. Uh, just, uh, just see to the Rovio and uh, retry the game. Okay, Sergey, one hardest trend from you. It 
in, in the in the industry, I would say developers taking control over their properties and over their fate and becoming responsible and. Uh, maybe stopping to blame publishers for all the misery and the actually like owning up this industry? For me, it's about service. It's about not just making, I mean, some people can make products, great, go make a product if you're making a product. But if you want to have a long-term relationship with your player, start thinking about your game as a service and start thinking about how players evolve as they play your game. And that, the reason why I think that's important is because it allows us to build small things in ways that we can test whether our game has got legs with the knowledge that we're going to continue developing and an ongoing conversation and shared relationship with our player. And the fact that we're seeing so many games which are using free-to-play is one thing, but actually I think the really interesting trend is not the free-to-play part, but it's the way that we're engaging and sustaining relationships with players, which is much more interesting. Okay. Um, one of the hottest things, I'm not sure if it's at a trend or not, uh, actually, but uh, I would like to see how, how the, all the new platforms that emerging uh, will fit into the whole uh, gaming experience, like, like watches, like uh, TV sets, because we haven't seen anything big there yet. So um, it's interesting for me to see what, how they will evolve and what kind of experiences we'll see and will fit to those devices. Uh, because like Oscar said before, they're all connected and every device is kind of has its own uh, purpose and uh, the best kind of products that will uh, will work there. So all the new stuff that, that emerges, it's really interesting to see how it's going to evolve. Just one other thing I wanted to chuck out is YouTubers. The way the games are being used as a medium to have conversations with people. Whether it's uh, you know PC games live streaming Twitter or or in the case of every player with you know people recording their games on their mobile and sharing those, we're starting to see a real big change in the way people use games in their everyday lives, not just through playing them, and I think that's utterly fascinating. Okay. Do we have something to add? Thank you very much. Please.